So what a phenomenal gathering that we have this evening. Thank you all for coming here. If you have come from outside of Kerala, welcome to Kerala, welcome to Tiruvananthapuram. And uh, we are happy to have Mr. Shashi Tharoor uh, talking to us about reimagining India. As you figured out, it is a very broad topic. It leaves a lot of scope to really imagine what uh, we are talking about. And to make it as lively and interactive as possible, what we intend to do is around 20 minutes into the conversation, I would like to hear from all of you. So we'll take a few questions from the audience. Very quick questions. They will have to be very short remarks or questions. So I hope we'll have mic runners available at 20 minutes. So that's one. So please prepare your questions. Make them sharp and uh, as, as, uh, as you like. So at that point, I generally, I want to give you a context of why we are discussing reimagining India. So any nation has to be imagined. That is what the political science and uh, the practice of nationalism and the national movement says that it proves that it ha you have to have an imagination. You have to have an imagination which leads into an action, a set of actions, and then you create a nation. So the making of Indian nation, I have argued elsewhere, that uh, it, it, it progressed on three dimensions. One is it is a federation of Hindu caste groups, and then it is a, it's, it's a compact between religious communities, and then it is also a compact between a lot of re regional interests and groups. So that makes it a three-dimensional concept of what makes modern India. At the moment, we are living through... I mean, I would challenge that, but we can... We can Fair enough. Fair. So, uh, at the moment, uh, we think there is an attempt to reimagine India by... Uh, the basic assumption is that the way India has been built over the last hundreds of years, I will go back... Uh, before Indian independence, the national movement, that was inadequate. Therefore, it has to be reimagined to consolidate the power of Indian nationhood. How do you see that process that is underway right now? So, Vagis, I've written an entire book on this theme. It's called The Battle of Belonging on Nationalism, Patriotism, and What It Means to Be an Indian. And what happened was that the book was launched during, it was written during and launched during COVID. So it kind of sank without trace. I'm constantly plugging it because I'm really very proud of that book and I want people to read it. But essentially, I would frame your thing, uh, your initial proposition somewhat differently. There are various kinds of nationalism in the world and I spent the first hundred pages of the book describing it conceptually as well as globally in its evolution and applications. And then I see Indian nationalism as a classic anti-colonial nationalism which morphed during the years 1946 to 50, when our constitution was created, it moved from an anti-colonial nationalism into what is called civic nationalism. And civic nationalism is a very relatively unusual kind of nationalism, and was at that time, because it is anchored in a constitution and in institutions rather than an identity. That is, that in those days, and for a hundred years before that, if you were German, you were white, you were German speaking, you were Christian. If you were French, you were white, you were French speaking, you were Christian. There were ethnic, religious identity issues in what constituted the idea of nationalism. In India, we chose what we would know later as the American model, which is where the individual is a subscriber to a larger national project, anchored in a constitution, and supported by institutions and that ultimately is civic nationalism. What we are witnessing in the last 10 years is a very conscious project to transform our civic nationalism into an ethno-religious nationalism. The very option that was explicitly rejected by the founding fathers when they wrote the constitution and that included Sardar Patel whom these people are now trying to hold up as a model. It included of course Dr. Ambedkar Nehru and others, they were very clear that India would not be. When pa Pakistan was created as a country for people who believe their religion determined their nationhood, India was explicitly not that. It was not a country for people of one religion or one language or one uh, uh, ethnicity. It was a country for all and the constitution was written to enshrine that idea. This is where today's entire tension is in my view, Burgis. 
So when you talk about the coalition of caste, there is another area where I would differ with you. Because I believe that this was an explicit issue of contention in the Constituent Assembly. And it was explicitly rejected, the idea of imagining India as a collection of communities, because that is what the British did. The British, for example, gave us a very limited franchise, but that was determined by your community identity. So if you were a Christian, you voted on one particular list. If you were a Muslim, you voted for candidates who are Muslim. You yourself were Muslim, and you could only have Muslim candidates on that list. That whole notion was part of the British project of divide and rule. So our people said, no, we will not do this. We will not fall into the same trap as the British. There will be neither any privileges, nor any disabilities, nor any categorization on the basis of religion, because that is what has ended up destroying our country. So there are no communities. But Ambedkar was smart enough to rationalize. He was a very strong individualist himself. He believed passionately in individual rights. But he was able to rationalize the concern that Varghese has expressed, the sense that people have communally. He was able to rationalize that by granting through the persistence of personal laws in some places and other community rights, the right for certain communities in certain areas to organize themselves as communities, while ensuring that citizenship rights inhered in the individual citizen of India. Please read the book. It's there in much more detail. But this is where I disagree with the, with the framing of the issue, though the issue is still we are both ending up at the same place, that there is an effort being made to change the nature of Indian nationalism in the last 10 years. Well, so I, I shouldn't go into defending my own framing. I will stay with the, the way you have framed it to carry the discussion forward, which is that India is a group of citizen. I mean, the premise, the fundamental premise of our nationhood is acceptance of the individuality of the citizen. So just for reference, I remember reading Gyan Pandey, who says that the trouble with that formulation is that you have a group of people, all of whom believe that you are an individual, and they are united by this only fact of their subscription to this model, that, OK, we are atomized individual, and we are the only shared trait that we have is the fact that we are all atomized individuals. No, the think, shared trait we have is that our individual identity is made secure by our Indian identity. What is that Indian identity? It's what it what is it inheres in the constitution. So the fact that we subscribe to a national project enshrined in a constitution, and that constitution guarantees us certain rights, which we share with every other individual. If we are India, then all of us have the same rights. It doesn't matter which god you worship or choose not to worship. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter which part of the country you were born in. Ultimately, as long as you're a citizen of India, each one of us has the same rights. That proposition is what was so radical. And everyone, Ambedkar was very aware we would have to give this content through the practice of the Constitution. And I would say we've only had mixed success. There have been areas of significant success where people have indeed dramatically understood the value of their political rights. And there have also been setbacks where political rights have been relatively too easily trampled upon. But nonetheless, bottom line, this is what it was all about. So assuming that all of us were subscribing to a general uh, general purpose or a, uh, what is enshrined in the constitutional, I mean, all those things we can debate, but we let us all take it as uh, a starting point for the discussion. Do you think that shared notion of the Indian constitution as our, uh, as our, 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 our the principles that keep us together is that that unraveling in some manner? Do you see that challenge? You see, there was always embedded in this idea, if you read uh, Nehru's discovery of India, for example, you've got this notion of an ancient civilization within, of course, a shared geography, <laughs> lots of elements of common history, because even though each of us in different parts of the country may have had different historical experiences at different times, there were always periods of overlap with others at different times, greater or lesser. So there was, in that sense, a common history entrenched in this common constitution and, above all, safeguarded and promoted by pluralist democracy. Everything rested together. Our ancient civilization, our shared geography, our common history, our constitution, and our uh, democratic politics. They are all sort of joint pillars holding up this edifice called India, which meant 
that those of us who are proud of other identities could be free to practice those identities. You can be a, a good Muslim, a good Keralite, a good Malayalam speaker, and a good Indian all at once. But it's because you subscribe to this notion of Indian nationhood that all those other identities could be secure. That you were safe to be a Muslim in India. You were safe to be a Malayali in India. You were safe to be a Keralite in India, and so on and so forth. And that is ultimately, I think, what was, what was indicated. I mean, what we've seen in the last 70 years is very much a growth of Indian consciousness. I mean, you can, the cheap answer is to illustrate it by looking at crowds at any Indian cricket match, right? You can see the shared Indianness. But you can equally get emotional and talk about the Indianness that is felt when the coffins came back from Kargil to 138 villages around India. That was a shared experience of loss and of belonging as well. So you've got, on the one hand, this common sense of belonging to a larger idea of India. And at the same time, you have your own sub-identities, which you are free to have. And we laugh about them, we joke about them, we crack jokes about Sardarjis, or we crack jokes about Marwaris, or we uh, have biases about a particular community, or whatever it may be. But it all doesn't matter, because ultimately this part of the shared collective consciousness of all the sub-identities of being Indian. And that, I think, is ultimately what protects our no, imagination of India. Is that imagination under threat right now? Is a question. Yeah, I'm sorry, you did ask that. I should have answered it. I would say it is at least partly under threat from a model of Hindu Rashtra that seeks to homogenize that which is heterogeneous and that seeks to promote this notion of one nation, one religion, one god, one language, one leader, and one political party all seeking to represent one nation. And that is, I think, fundamentally at odds with the imagination of India enshrined in the Constitution. And to my mind, is fundamentally at odds with the reality of India. Certainly sitting in Kerala, this seems almost laughable. Because we are a, a state which, which, which has celebrated a very different kind of togetherness, where we may have a shared culture and a shared language, but we know we have multiple religions, we know we have multiple uh, cultural habits, we are uh, happy to enjoy and share all of them without at the same time feeling that that subtracts us from everything else, but we know there's a difference. I mean, take Islam, the added to the chip on the shoulder of many in northern India, versus the knowledge in Kerala that Islam did not come by the sword. It came as a message from people who had been trading with Kerala for centuries. Take, um, take, I mean, almost anything else, one can find example after example. Um, the Jews came here uh, centuries before Christ, and they remain to this day the only Jewish diaspora in the world that never knew a single instance of anti-Semitic persecution. So our, our, our approach to these diversities is very different from those who experience difference through what they remember or are being persuaded to remember as acts of oppression so, and cruelty. Shashi, you, you, we started discussing, your emphasis was very much on the idea of citizenship, the individual as, as a basic component or constituent unit of the nation. But uh, in the last 15-20 minutes, you frequently refer to group identities, Christians, Hindus, Muslims, Malayalis, Tamils, Dravidians. So how do these two things reconcile? No, that's my point precisely, is that these different identities are possible without any threat to anybody else, only as long as we have the secure carapace, the umbrella of the constitutional protection of our individual citizenship. The fact that you are a Christian, the fact that I am a Hindu, has nothing to do with either our relationship with each other, our roles in society or in the nation, or indeed in our rights and obligations. It makes no difference whatsoever. It is simply part of who you are. It's in, in some ways no different from saying, I went to a particular school and you went to a different school, and we have loyalties emerging from that schooling. Or I support a particular cricket team, or you, you prefer football and you prefer a different football team. These are all attributes that sh help shape your identity. We all have multiple identities, no problem with that. But ultimately, that individual citizenship protected by our constitution is what gives us our security. That's, that's the message that I want to convey to all of you today. And that is precisely when we speak about the reimagining of India, it is indeed a very different India that would emerge from the project that is now 10 years underway and which has become steadily, clearly more defined. And what is, what is that definition? It is one that in many ways elides or eliminates the diversities in favor of a uniformity. 
while claiming to be in the name of unity. Right. My argument would be unity is not uniformity. You so, can have unity amid diversity. That was one of the old cliches of our growing up in India. I'll What's wrong with it? I'll ask one more question before I will take a few questions from the audience. So this idea of the nation constituted by free individuals, mm. uh, there were arguments during the national movement that Indian society is incapable of imagining a country on those lines. Those skeptics have been proven wrong. Was there something inherently wrong with the, that experiment or was it something that was unsuitable for India that we are facing a challenge or a threat to that? What's interesting is the skeptics were proven wrong because the skeptics would usually say, I've read a number of books and articles published in the 50s and 60s, right up to the 1967 elections when Neville Maxwell, the notorious author of India's China War, he wrote an article in the London Times confidently asserting this is going to be India's last democratic election because India won't exist after this election, 1967. And they got it wrong because they didn't understand these other forces that kept us together. The civilizational consciousness, the history, the geography as well, the shared cultural experience, the shared political experience. Now what's interesting about the skeptics is they didn't think that what actually worked would work. When the emergency happened, I was in America as a graduate student, I got a lot of that. See, we told you it wouldn't work, it wasn't going to work, you, you know, this is going to collapse, it can only even be held together as a dictatorship. Instead, what happened? It ended with a free election and a throwing out of the government and, and India continued to survive. We survived an emergency, we survived coalition governments that rose and fell, one in 13 days, one in six months, one in nine months, and our democracy survived, everything survived. So what has worked is what is being challenged by our friends who are now in power, because what has worked, they are trying to re, they're trying to uninvent and reinvent in a very different form. This is why in the battle of belonging, I've tried to show the clear distinction between these two kinds of nationalism. Because when they speak of the unity of India, they mean something very different from those of us who spoke of the unity of India as embracing a wide variety of diversities. That, because it was a cliche, people thought, you know, ah, it's just a, it's just like a slogan, let's cast it aside. But in fact, it was a wonderful basis for living together. And I worry that this much more narrow-minded approach of, of those who've been in power for the last 10 years could end up actually provoking divisions rather than unity. Right. So we will, in the next segment, we will address that last line, which is the concentration of political power in a narrow geographical strip that is actually creating uh, a lot of friction within the constituent units, particularly the linguistic units. And it's more specifically in the context of the looming delimitation. We will get there in the next segment. The third segment, just as a teaser, we will also be addressing this question of reimagining Shashi Tharoor. So we will get there. Before that, I will take four questions if anyone has right here. I think somebody is going here. to bring a mic into the audience. Somebody, no? the mic here. This. Please introduce yourself. Keep the question or the remark very short. Hello. Uh, sir, do you remember me? We have uh, seen once. I, I am Abhijit Pradeep. So we you met. You are the young man who asked me a question in the Legislative Assembly, didn't yes, you? Sir, yes, May, sir. Yes, I remember you. Uh, 11 years old, by the way, this young boy. Now I am 13. At that time, I was 12. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> well, all the better. Go on. Sir, I have two questions. The first one is right now, um, we are in an, an another threat of a dictatorship and an emergency. Even I am, as a child, even I am worried that. Uh, I am. I might be facing a dictatorship right now. Even I am scared. My grandpa grandparents were not scared about this and all because they they were not affected by the politics. But in the 21st century, even the children are getting affected by the politics. Not only politics, even the society is framing people. Even small children, in the basis of religion. Okay, a that's a good remark. You have a second one to make. You yeah, continue. Uh, so my. First, uh, so uh, a few a few days ago, I uh, saw a uh, uh, article on a newspaper, and that was in Karnataka, a person was killed for eating beef, just for eating beef, guys. Okay. Okay. So I'll take that. Do you have a specific question? It's more of the kind so of a remark. Or? My specific question is that at at this uh, point, most of the people are going to outer nations and all. So, but I want to live in India safely. So for what, what can I do for that? What can he do? We'll take, the, we'll take a few questions together or? 
No, let's just quickly okay. one by one. I, mean, I, I might forget now. Uh, so, first of all, Pradeep, uh, we're not in a dictatorship yet, or I wouldn't be able to speak to you like this. We have an election coming up where we can still have the right to reject the policies that we don't like, and we can put a government in place that you will not have to worry about. So, as long as we have those rights, we're not a dictatorship. But I do worry about our democracy. There is a very famous institute in Sweden called the Varieties of Democracy Institute, or VDEM, which last year decided to downgrade India from a democracy to an electoral autocracy. That is, we can freely elect our leaders, but once they're elected, they can conduct themselves like autocrats or dictators. That's, that's the worry that they see. And we should be able to take our future back in our own hands by exercising our votes. You don't have one yet, but in five years you will. So keep focusing on that. Sorry, you Secondly, you want to eat, your second question, you want to, to live safely in India and eat what you want to eat. I agree. So this is the, uh, that's my first uh, You have to be quick. Safely in yes, India. very quickly. Second how question. To live in, uh, uh, how to live safely in this India where framing is a lot, uh, a great problem. So that's my first question. Sorry, I didn't what, hear that. What how can it? you live safely in India? Is that how, what you mean? How can, how can we safely live in India where a society is always framing us? No, first of all, it's still illegal to kill somebody for eating beef. So whoever did that, the police have a duty to catch that person. And that person should yeah. be tried and sent to prison. That's what our system still... So there, there's no question that that person cannot get away with having killed someone for eating beef. Right. Having said that, the fact that there are people who think like this and who believe they are emboldened to act on it, that is worrying. And I agree with you. We need to change. It, the society belongs to all of us. You can grow up and be a voice for reason and for cooperation and, and not for this kind of intolerance. I hope you will be. So my next question is that. Uh, or oh, others waiting <laughs> we to ask. Now move on. Who Sir, has? One more yeah, can we have the mic there in the corner? Sir, this, this one more minute. question. So more question. To, can, can you just give the mic to the person on your next left, please, please, please? Sir, we have sir. to move on. We have to move on. Please, please. Catch me as yeah, I yeah, leave. We, you we, can we, ask we, me privately. We'll continue okay. this conversation outside. Well uh, good evening, sir. So, as a law student, uh, as the topic is reimagine India. Uh, the IPC is changed to BNS, which is Bharatiya Nyaya Sanhita. CRPC is changed to Bharatiya Nagarik Suraksha Sanhita. And Indian Evidence Act, Act is changed to Bharatiya Saksha Bill. So, as a uh, general person, as a not speaking from the political side, what is your opinion as the, the topic opinion is Opinion on the new criminal India. court, right? Yeah. Well, using, it, using Hindi titles is in fact inappropriate because it's always been a convention that laws will be named in English so that they make sense everywhere. Many of the non-Hindi speaking MPs have objected, but they've passed the law. I think unless the courts rule that the name will have to be changed, which frankly seems unlikely they will do, we're saddled with this. But as you know, these things always get reduced to acronyms. So the Indian Penal Code was the I IPC and the Criminal Procedure Code was the CRPC. Similarly, this will become BNS and something else. That's what's going to happen in the end of the day. But it's also unfortunate they've renumbered all the crimes. So a 420 is no longer a 420. He's a 387 or something. We'll never remember which one it was. And the old expressions and even movies like Shri 420 will become out of date. Very sad. So we will take the third and the fourth questions together for, yeah. for, for this. Yeah. Yep. Here. Recently and the fourth is the white t-shirt there. Ah, yeah. Recently, uh, Honorable Supreme Court of India Recently, Honorable Supreme Can you introduce Court, yourself, please? Hi, my name is Manu Thomas. Uh, yeah, recently, Honorable Supreme Court of India rejected uh, same-sex marriage, but on the other hand, they accepted decriminalization of uh, uh, same, I mean, like homogeneous community. Is it a conflict of individual versus societal individuality? Very good question, because in fact, as you probably know, I attempted as a member of parliament twice to introduce private member bills that would have decriminalized uh, homosexuality, removed the criminal prohibitions uh, in uh, Section 377. And in both cases, I was shouted down by a BJP majority that voted not to permit the introduction of this bill. And therefore, I advised the petitioners they would have no choice but to go the judicial route. And that's what they did. And they finally prevailed. But same-sex marriage seemed to be one step further. And I would advise those who, who are passionate about this issue and want to be activists on this issue to pursue instead the idea of a civil contract situation in order to guarantee the same rights 
We had a very interesting case, a tragic case just last week, where in a situation like this of a same-sex lifetime relationship, one partner died and the other partner was not permitted all the rights that a spouse would normally have had, even though de facto that partner had lived like a spouse. And eventually, uh, the court came up with some odd compromise where I think he was given the body but was not given any rights over the other things, the bank account, so on and so forth. It's a complicated issue. And that's why if there are still cultural objections to using the term marriage, we can go the intermediate route that many Western countries did before, before they adopted same-sex marriage. For many years, many Western countries have the notion of a civil partnership, which is a contract under which each one freely gives spousal rights to the other person. And that could be, for example, one person gets a heart attack and the hospital wants you to sign a form, you have the legal right to do it. Whereas if you're living currently in India with a, a same-sex partner, that partner has no rights. You'll have to ask your, he'll have to ask your sister or mother or somebody else to sign that hospital form. These are the kinds of issues that would change if this concept was adopted. And I would urge people who care about this to try and go to court and get that right. I think the courts will be receptive. Thank you. Yeah, we will uh, take one more question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was a uh, uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Anushri Kapil. I'm from Uttar Pradesh. Uh, sir, uh, I want to ask, I mean, I want to have your opinion about, uh, do you think our, uh, with all due respect, our founding fathers or the previous governments in states like UP failed us and you have 80 Lok Sabha seats from, you know, UP. So it does define governments, the central government in a major way. So do you think uh, somewhere or the other they failed us and we are here where we are today? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is where Verghese's initial question is, is right. That is that even if the constitution imagined Indians as individual citizens, a lot of Indians voted as communities. I mean, there's that joke that uh, when you cast your vote, you vote your caste. And that was particularly true in northern India. And in UP, uh, but not just UP, I must say across the board in many, many northern states, ideology or individual conviction mattered much less politically than identity as an instrument of political mobilization. So people mobilized castes and subcastes, and coalitions were formed of castes for voting purposes. So Ambedkar, imagine the individual voter exercising agency through his ballot. But in practice, that individual voter was guided by a caste leader to vote for a candidate endorsed by the caste or subcaste. That, I admit, is the actual practice. I was talking of the imagination of India in the constitution. Now, given that practice, what happened in UP was that the caste coalition that had been constructed originally by the Congress party, which was frankly Brahmins, Muslims, and Dalits, that was the combination that kept winning a majority of the seats. That got supplanted by a different coalition that comprised strongly of other backward castes, particularly the Yadavs, along with Muslims, that numerically were able to pip this other coalition to the post. And then, of course, the Dalits came up with their own political formation, which took away the Dalit vote from the Congress. And you found the Muslims voting for this new coalition led by the Samadwadi party, and the Congress then indeed lost all uh, political uh, strength in UP over the last 20 years. So there is a case where you can argue that that the voting habits of individuals determined how their political destinies would be. Now, you've seen an interesting idea, which is at odds with Verghese's initial approach. What the BJP is saying is, let us prevent people going through these caste coalition approaches by creating a totalizing monolithic Hindu identity that subsumes all castes. Now, that idea hasn't fully been bought, which is why they need so far to claim to speak for OBCs, they claim to speak for Dalits and with different groups. They need to still mobilize voters on the basis of these sub-identities. But their, their imagination is different from the constitutional imagination of the individual voter. It's a, an imagination of the collective Hindu majority as a political entity in itself. You see what I'm saying? That's what the BJP is trying to promote. And I'm afraid in UP, the last couple of elections, you, the majority electorate, has bought into that imagination. So that's a, that's a good segue into the question of federalism. Uh, you said that you, we have the right to vote out what you do not want. But the way voting is organized doesn't make that option that easy. For just to give a, just a figure for context, so the BJP has 37% of national votes 
and 55% of Indian Lok Sabha. So it really doesn't matter who, in, who a Malayali votes for uh, to, 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 to uh, decide what happens in India. Again, just to cite what happened in the case of Article 370, it was clearly mentioned that it is they won a mandate. The only difference is that the mandate was won elsewhere, not in Kashmir, to change the status of Kashmir. So this is going to aggravate, this question of regional imbalance is going to aggravate because of the looming delimitation of Lok Sabha constituency. Correct. The lapsing of the 91st Amendment in 2026, and that's something I'm sure many of you are already aware of. In 1976, Indira Gandhi passed a constitutional amendment freezing the Lok Sabha constituencies on the basis of the census of 1971. And the reason for that was precisely in order not to punish those states that were serious about population control and reward those that failed to control their population. So states with better human development indicators, more empowerment of women, and therefore women choosing to have fewer children, have them later, space them differently and so on, ended up having smaller populations. And Indira Gandhi argued that they should not be punished for it by losing political clout. So it was frozen at the 1971 census in 1976. 25 years later, when that 42nd Amendment uh, came up, when that 25 years lapsed, at that point, Atal Bihari Vajpayee's BJP government decided to renew it for another 25 years unanimously in Parliament. No one objected and was renewed again. So today, the reason we have 20 Lok Sabha seats in Kerala, out of uh, a total figure of 543 nationally, is because we are still operating on the 71 census. <coughs> this BJP government has made it very clear they have no desire to continue with that. And they are going to lift this. They're going to allow the amendment to lapse. It lapses in 26. At that point, a fresh delimitation will be done. And they have two choices. If they want to keep the total number of seats roughly the same, then the South will lose seats and the Hindi belt will gain them. Or they can increase the size of parliament so that no one loses, but others gain. So UP will go from 80 seats to 120, and Kerala will remain at 20. But the net effect of all this is that you will end up in a situation where the Hindi belt, so-called, will essentially have two-thirds of the seats in the new Indian parliament. And that means they can do anything. They can pass a law making Hindi the national language. They can, make, they can pass laws on various other aspects. The Finance Commission might reduce the amount of resources coming back to the southern states. All sorts of things might happen. So there is a very big concern being voiced that if you create a situation where one narrow group of states, because of their failure to control their population, should have the dominant political clout, then you will essentially threaten the unity and integrity of India. And this is where we will need a new federal imagination. We will have to find new ways of ensuring that this does not divide the country. One possibility, for example, is to reimagine the Rajya Sabha, to create, in effect, a veto for a group of states other than the Hindi heartland states, at least in the upper house, so that you cannot just amend the constitution at will and change the country altogether. Because if you change the country in a way that, say, all the southern states object to, but they don't have the numerical strength anymore to prevent, you might create something that could truly threaten the unity of the country. And this is why it's very important to use one's political imagination and find new models that would prevent this happening. Uh, another possibility is to borrow the American idea, create more states of roughly equivalent size, maybe one or two states will be larger, one or two states will be very small, like Sikkim or whatever. And then you end up saying that nonetheless, even if in the Lok Sabha, their seats are determined by population, in the Rajya Sabha, they'll all have the same number of seats. So imagine if Sikkim has two seats and Kerala has two seats and UP also only has two seats, it will be no, not possible for any small group of states to dominate the rest. That's how the Americans did it in their constitution. And it seems to me that it made sense for them there. It didn't make sense for our founders when they wrote our constitution. But tomorrow it might just do that. But we'll have to have a very serious conversation about this in 2026, failing which I really worry for the future of the India we know and love. So I think that is the point where the, the basic principle of one person, one vote actually comes in conflict with a more sustainable, viable conception of a federation that is based on group rights. Uh, 
just to add one or two numbers that actually buttress the argument that you made, in Kerala, around 16 lakh people elect a Lok Sabha member. I think, no, that's not right. It's 20 lakhs, and it's, sorry, 2 million as a population of the Irvan of the Buram, um, adult population, of which maybe 1.6 will turn up maximum to vote. 1.3 to 1.6 will turn up to vote, maximum. Okay. So okay. that's 13 so lakhs to 16 lakhs, right. not less 16. 16. I ah, think. 16, 16 is what you're, you're yeah, right. Correct. I'm yeah. so sorry. 16 average, uh, 16 lakh. Whereas in Rajasthan, it is above 25 lakh per constituency. And UP is 27. UP is 27. So what actually happens is that Malayali's vote, technically speaking, is mu much more valuable at the moment than a Rajasthani or a Uttar UPI's vote at the moment. Though Malayalis rarely get to elect a ruling M party MP. That's a different story altogether. <laughs> so when you correct that anomaly, you end up in a situation as that you described, political power will shift. As the calculations stand today, Kerala could lose as many as six seats yeah. or maybe even seven seats. If you the have the same total. Seat. But they have built a very large parliament chamber precisely because they want to expand it. No, but My worry is they want to create an Indian version of the Chinese People's Consultative Congress where she will come and thump the table when the great leader speaks and you have no time to speak or debate anything yourself. But regardless, proportionately, Kerala's yeah. strength in Lok Sabha will shrink by 30% roughly. Correct. Absolutely. So that is what we are looking at. And so it's going to be worse when the census comes. Yes. You and I are talking on the basis of the 2011 census. That's right. Yes. But had there been a census in 2021, we would have been the one state in the country to have provenly shown a loss in population. So yep. even so, our population would be smaller than what it was in 2011. So that is that will have to be the, the core, the axis of any new imagination of India. Would you say that? A I, new I think, I, I, between I the think, regions? I think yes. I, I mean, I would like to see it anchored within the same constitutional idea that I've talked about. But yes, I think the mechanics of a constitutional idea are always up for debate and amendment. But will the North show the imagination and the broad-mindedness to feel the need to accommodate the South, the Northeast, the non-Hindi speaking states? Or will they say, tough luck, one man, one vote, that's democracy? You just lump it and you'll have to accept your fate. Um, I mean, already we've seen this very interesting argument that some uh, BJP members are making, that if you look at any individual state, there are places within the state that are contributing more, perhaps more taxes, more revenues, and, and receiving less. So, but within a state, no one is talking about those discrepancies. So you think of India like one state, why should you talk about discrepancies? So what if the South loses out a bit, we're all one country? Let the North gain, how does it matter? That kind of talk is coming out quite systematically. And, um, and that could be, could be a real challenge. Now, it's possible that this entire conversation will seem foolish a hundred years from now when there are as many Hindi speakers in Kerala because Keralites are not enough to do all the work required. So UPIs and Biharis and Jharkandis have all come and settled here and they're speaking Hindi and teaching us Hindi so that we can speak to them, otherwise we can't get our work done. And suddenly Kerala becomes a Hindi-speaking state and we are laughing at this fear that Keralites had. Who knows? Yes, it is. It is. 100 years from now, but not perhaps tomorrow. <laughs> right. So, we've been talking a lot of serious stuff, uh, reimagining India. As I said, in the next few minutes, we will discuss reimagining Shashi Tharoor. So, have you... Hold on, hold on. Have you watched this film, Rocky or Rani Ki Prem Kahani? Have you watched? No, actually, I genuinely haven't, but there is one clip from it that various friends have sent me. So, uh, so you think there are families where the English that you speak are, is spoken, actually? <laughs> yeah, yeah, including mine. Yeah. So just a little earlier at four o'clock, my sister and I had a session speaking English to each other. So, you can see that there are families that speak like that. But the truth is that, you know, there is an urban educated bunch of Indians who went to schools where they were encouraged to speak only English to each other. And certainly as a son of migrant parents, my parents, my father went to England, married a woman, married his, my mother from Kerala, brought her to England, I was born there. Then he moved to Bombay, I went to school there. Then he moved to Calcutta, I went to high school there. Then I left Calcutta and went to Delhi on my own for college, I went to college there. So the result was not only that I ended up with English being the only common language in all these places, but frankly, also, I developed a pan-Indian sensibility because of that experience of a Marinadan Malayali migrant serving in various parts of India. So, so many people try to imitate you. Nobody has done it so successfully. That is a different thing. Uh, but uh, you, feel, you feel flattered or? 
<laughs> oh, I don't know about flattering. These memes that go around, half of them are grossly unfair. Half of them are gibberish. I mean, anytime you get a forward saying, Shashi Tharoor sent me these Diwali greetings, please ignore because I didn't write those Diwali greetings. I wouldn't because they don't make any sense. But there are some rather, rather no, funny no. ones going around that I'm quite no, no, happy but to one, see. One that. which I particularly like is the word that you tried to do at that Vidyarambam with little kid, I can't really pronounce. But then you had to actually, you put out a Twitter post saying that you actually said that it was only Om Shri. And that's Hari. right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I, I wrote Om Hari Shri. Om Hari Shri, sorry. In, yeah. in three different scripts. Yes. I said, you may as well learn the Sanskrit slash Hindi Devanagari script, the Malayalam script and the English script. And so I taught them all, all three, and wrote Om Hari Shri in all three. That was what I did. But that's, that's, that's not too difficult. So, you've been frequently used for commercial purpose by filmmakers and other people, including in some Malayalam films. You know, you, have you asked for royalty? Or? <laughs> no, no. Actually, some of it is quite flattering. There's that innocent, innocent movie. Yes, yeah. You remember that? Yes. Where he... About uh, Dilib, he's telling Dilip... Uh, that you are not a patch on uh, Shashi Tharoor or something? And there's another one. He ad libs these lines apparently. There's another one where he told his, the character playing his wife, yeah. What kind of a wife are you? Give me a son who's such an idiot. You should have, you know, if I had married somebody else, my son would have been Shashi Tharoor. <laughs> which yes. I thought was deeply and embarrassingly flattering. I hope that some voters see it also <laughs> when the next election rolls around. <laughs> well, so uh, what are your plans now? Why did you? contest the election for Congress president. We all knew what the results would be. Yes, I suppose that's true. You also knew what the results would I be. It became very obvious very soon after the nomination when there was, shall we say, an official candidate who was not declared to be the official candidate, but who did, mm -hmm. after all, serve that role. And, and the fact is that I did so because when an election was announced, there were a number of people within the party who came to me expressing their unhappiness with certain things. And at the same time, their loyalty to the party and wanting to see the party better and urge me to be their standard bearer. And I must say that um, I did go to the Gandhi family because I knew they were the uh, high command of the party. And I said, you know, I'm thinking of, of contesting. What is your view? And had Mrs. Gandhi, who brought me into politics, said to me, no, 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 we don't want you to rock the boat. Please don't contest. I would have felt honor bound to respect her wishes. But instead of saying that, what she told me is, you must contest. I encourage you. I'm very tired. I want to make way for a new president. Please contest. Then I went and saw uh, Priyanka and I went and saw Rahul Vag. Rahul was marching in Kerala at the time. And we marched together for about 45 minutes in Palakkad, having this conversation. And in all three cases, I was strongly encouraged. So I felt that the Gandhi family, who is seen in many ways as embodying the sort of legitimacy of the party, they are actually welcoming and encouraging it. Who am I not to, uh, not to try? So that's the spirit in which I went ahead. Uh, and I must say that when it became clear this wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't in fact exactly how the party election was going to be conducted, I decided, A, I'm not a quitter, so it will look embarrassing to pull out uh, as soon as my nomination had been submitted. Because I think if I remember rightly, the closing day for nominations was Friday, and both Mr. Kargi and I put our nominations forward on Friday, and the date for withdrawal was Monday. And people thought by the weekend I would cave, and I decided I was not going to, because that's not me, number one. But number two, I also felt, let me use the opportunity to articulate a number of concerns that party members, including office bearers, had shared with me that need to get an airing. The problem was the audience I needed to air it to, namely the delegates who could vote, were largely denied to me. And so it wasn't easy. And I found that because I had no choice, I would, could only use the media. And when I started using the media, naturally some accused me of disloyalty uh, in, ra in raising and airing these issues publicly, which should have been discussed internally. So it was a, a complicated process, the entire thing. But I'm still glad that I gave voice to everyone. And I ended up with the slightly bizarre distinction of being the most successful loser in the history of the Congress party. Because in all the elections the Congress has ever had, no one has apparently won as many votes while losing as I have. So you got more votes than you expected or fewer than you expected? Well, I thought I would get a little more than I got. Um, simply because when we called people, a lot of people pledged votes. Uh, some of them called during the balloting saying that they had been ordered to take pictures of their ballot before they cast it and so on. Uh, and therefore there was nothing they could do. Uh, and we got those messages. Some ballots were spoiled. 
by over-enthusiastic supporters who drew a heart around my name or oh my God. Okay. cancel the other candidate's name, all of which invalidates ballots. So that also happened. Do, they, uh, do people do such kind of thing or there is it only the, if the ballots, paper ballots were there? All these were paper ballots. Yeah. The Congress party you would have got the election those, those kind of awards in Thiruvananthapuram, a lot many of them, if the ballots were actually paper ballots. The so heart, I'm safe, heart, safer yeah, with EVMs. Saving a lot of votes thanks to EVM. <laughs> thanks to EVMs. But anyway, that is not the party's position in EVM, so don't, in a jokey way, don't get me into trouble with the party. Uh, the party is genuinely concerned about the potential mismatch between EVM votes uh, as cast and as recorded on the machine. And they've suggested some very specific ways in which that could be improved. And I certainly hope the Election Commission considers it. One very simple thing is that the ballot where you press the button should be connected first to the control unit and only then to the VV pad. So that in other words, you actually see the same in all three. Whereas currently what happens is that if you vote, it goes to the VV pad, you see your VV pad has recorded your thing, but we don't know what goes from the VV pad to the control unit. And that has raised some suspicions. Personally, I think, um, uh, I don't think that if it was that easy to steal elections, that the BJP would go to the enormous trouble that they do uh, to actually fight and win them. But I accept the proposition that as long as potentially it could be misused, it is the Election Commission's duty to ensure that all such fears are put at rest by eliminating the possibility of, uh, of this kind of manipulation. So, so what, they should do that. What, what is the next stop for Shashi Tharoor? Are you in the race for the Chief Ministership of Kerala? Hey, wait a minute. I'm still going to be a Lok Sabha candidate in Thiruvananthapuram. I hope the party has yet to announce its candidacies. And as you know, in our system, the party decides these matters. All I can say is, uh, having thought long and hard, and after having gone through all of the experiences of the last few years, I've decided that if the party wants me, and if the people want me, I should contest. And on the second part, a lot of people have come to me. Saying that I should contest that and is, I, I feel… That is for Thiruvananthapuram Lok Sabha constituency, just to clarify. Thiruvananthapuram Lok Sabha constituency in the forthcoming election. Right. But the people want and uh, if the party wants, you might actually consider running for the Chief Ministership of Kerala. No, that is a separate issue altogether. <laughs> First of all, as you know, my focus has been national and international so far. Yes, a lot of people have asked me to take an interest in Kerala. I said, first, let us see if we can unseat the government of the centre. If we succeed, that's where I think all of us need to be. But if it turns out that the results go differently, then we have to examine all options. And this could well be one of those options. I will have to say that at this point, I'm really focused on the Lok Sabha. That's where my duty is. That's where the party, I think, wants really to make a very strong effort. And let us try and see if we can get the results in the Lok Sabha that will give us a fighting shot at changing the government in the center, which is changing so many of the things that you and I have been talking about this evening. And once that happens, then it's a different story. If it doesn't happen, um, Kerala's elections are two years away. And uh, I, you know, as they say in the James Bond movies, never say never. There, there you have a very clear answer, I think, uh, in, in a very typical Shashi Tharoor style. So let me press the, on that question. Just once more, a little more. So you've been taking a lot of interest in uh, constituencies and places other than Thiruvananthapuram in the recent past. You've been a uh, sought after speaker in a lot of uh, campaign meetings of the Congress in other parts of the state. So hasn't, uh, has, have people told you that maybe you should consider? Uh, well, look, these invitations have come and they've come with very strong backing from party colleagues, whether MPs or other office bearers in different parts of the state. And the truth of the matter is that, yes, my interest was principally Thiruvananthapuram because I've got to get elected here. But until elections are called and until um, I'm announced as the candidate, I do technically have the room to be able to help others elsewhere. And yes, I have been doing a lot of events in other parts of the state on the demands of people. Of the, I have never once solicited an invitation anywhere else. But when invitations have come, and in earlier times you would say, no, we've got too many commitments here, we have now been accepting them. So I've been to pretty much every uh, district in the course of these 15 years, but in the last two or three years, I've been to at least eight or nine districts for different functions. And I think that number is likely to go up uh, after the Lok Sabha poll. All I can say about that is, as long as people want to hear from me, as long as they feel there is some value added I can offer, 
it would be churlish of me not to give of myself, my time, my energy, my ideas to them. So I'm doing that. The day the invitations dry up, that will be a message in itself. But so far, the invitations keep coming. And, and at the moment, we're running about 40 to 1. I mean, I do one of every 40 invitations I'm getting, roughly. So much of travel, so much of writing, so much of speaking. Can you tell us what is an average day for Shashi Tharoor? There isn't one. Every, there isn't an average. Right, okay. Every day is different. Every day is challenging. In some ways, the lightest day I have is when parliament is in session. When there is a predictable agenda, you know what bills are coming up, you know what you have to prepare, where you do your homework for question hour, you do your preparation for zero hour and so on, and you have a full... In every other time, when parliament is not in session, when I'm here, for example, every day is unpredictable. Let's say I make an appointment for an event at 10 o'clock. By the time I come out into the living room, there are 40 people standing there with their petitions and requests. And there is no question for a Kerala politician that they get priority first and you keep your audience waiting at 10 o'clock. So from the morning onwards, you're already running late. Uh, and then you, other things come up all the time unexpectedly. You come home for lunch sometimes, you find there are people waiting then. You come home at night after an exhausting day, there are still people waiting there. That is life. And you just have to understand that, that in Kerala politics, that's the way. I don't think um, in, in, in many other parts of the country that MPs have to do quite as much as we do here. But that's part of life and I, I, I find that the unpredictability can be exhausting but it can also be what keeps you stimulated and interested. So that anywhere that you go, the number of people that want to get, an, get a picture with you. The uh, selfie culture. Yeah, selfie, I mean it is, it's, at any place it is much higher than a, a, a Bollywood star. Oh, yeah, have, yeah. You, have, you, have you considered <laughs> acting in a film or have you got an <laughs> offer to do that? I've had an offer or two which I've turned down. Why? Um, Time. Or? Because, uh, honestly, I'm in a serious profession, want to be taken seriously. In fact, one of the offers I made was for a film that went on to become the number one hit of the year in India, uh, where I would have played a cameo role as Foreign Minister of India. Okay. And uh, in that role, I was given the liberty to speak my own lines. And that particular scene would have been repeated six times during the film in various flashbacks to make a point. So it was a very tempting offer, only one day shooting in Istanbul of all places. Okay. And I made the mistake of consulting a couple of friends. And the friend said, if you want to be foreign minister, don't play foreign minister. So I thought well, that, yeah, that is a typical Congress attitude. So I, I declined the part. Amusingly enough, when the word leaked in Bollywood circles that I was offered this role and I turned it down, Raj Babbar, who was still in parliament in those days and who had been a Bollywood star, said to me, what a foolish thing you did. Of course, you look at me. I am an MP and I've also acted in movies. Why can't you do it? Anyway, it was too late by then. I had turned it down. <laughs> so with all these things, when do you write? Do you have a specific uh, time slot every day that you... It's changed. I mean, in the old days, I would like to write uh, ideally during the day, much earlier in my UN career. Saturday and Sunday, I could literally sit at the computer and write 18 hours especially if my family wasn't around at the time. But uh, that's, that's no longer possible. It wasn't possible by the later parts of my UN career when I became much more uh, busy. And then in politics, it's not. There is no such thing on a Saturday or Sunday. In fact, there are sometimes weekends where I don't realize it's a weekend because my program is so full. Uh, and that's unfortunately the reality. So nowadays, I do all my writing at night, which can be, unfortunately, and I should not say this to an editor of the Hindu because I do a column for them once a month and sometimes that column is written in a state of such exhaustion I wonder if it will pass muster but so far it has it always has so it was too good to last so we have to now come to a close with this session. yes sir we have uh, we have one last question from the audience side let's take that question after that we will wind up the session so Please. then uh, Hi, sir. I'm Rizwan. Uh, my question is about the uh, future of minorities in India. So yeah. The, the minorities having... Uh, Got it. Future of minorities. We'll take then two more questions and we'll take it all together. This lady here. Yes. In reimagining India, what kind of a government do you see in future? We saw paralysis under a coalition government. And now we are seeing dictatorship in a majoritarian rule. So what kind of... The same question in a different uh, form. Uh, he, you have got your chance. This is the last one. He's given the mic to yeah. someone already. So that's it. 
Rashan sir. Sir, my question is on your opening remarks. You said that uh, India was envisioned as a nation with civic nationalism, but was the government able to envision what was in the constitution in a practical basis? And if it had, did it not create a disgruntled population upon which the current government is preying upon? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, blame can easily be apportioned. And obviously, if we are going through the kind of phase we're going through, some of it can be explained by the perceived failures of the past. And I can't, I can't dispute people's right to, to feel that way. But going back to these two questions, first on minorities in India, my argument had traditionally been that we are all minorities in India, that there is no such thing as a majority, because if you take the Hindus, for example, as a majority, not no majority belongs to one caste. Every caste is a minority. No region has a majority in India. Every region produces a minority. So a Hindi speaking Hindu male from Uttar Pradesh cannot claim, to, in my view, to be a majority because de facto his caste makes him a minority or his language makes him a minority or his state makes him a minority. Now that's my view, but obviously that's not what you meant by the question. So in all fairness, I should answer your question. You mean religious minorities. And for religious minorities, I believe that the only answer lies in insisting that no Indian, irrespective of faith, should be deprived in any way of their full agency in our state and in our society because of their religion. Now, the truth of the matter is, when we are seeing a government that is transforming our country more and more explicitly into a Hindu Rashtra, where the Prime Minister goes and does a pran, pran Pratishtha at a temple, when all of these things are happening, it becomes more and more difficult to assure a Muslim or a Christian, maybe not in Kerala, but certainly in other parts of the country, that they would be treated in exactly the same way by such a government. And that is definitely something worrying. We, uh, my party and the like-minded parties on our side of the divide, feel very strongly that we have to assert the rights of every Indian, irrespective of religion, and we will do so. We stand for that, and we've always stood for that. On the question, ma'am, of your thing, I, I understand your dilemma. I believe that the ideal government one can imagine is one where both policies are indeed carried out effectively and efficiently without what you described as a, as, 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 a, as a problem that comes from too many coalition partners tugging away at each other, but that they respect the fact that in Dr. Ambedkar's famous words, majorities are inherently temporary, that there is no such thing as a permanent majority in any democracy, and that if you think you're a majority today, behave with respect for the minorities, whether communal minorities or political minorities, because tomorrow you will find yourself amongst the political minority. And I think he was right. People tend to be very short-sighted in their thinking. And no system anywhere in the world which fancied it would last for a thousand years has lasted. Somebody just put out on social media yesterday a statement by our prime minister talking about a the impact, the, the changes he was making lasting for a thousand years, side by side with a clipping from a 1930s newspaper with Hitler talking about the thousand year Reich. And the fact is nobody who envisaged a thousand years. In fact, um, in the 1940s, I have come across British statements talking about British Raj in India lasting at least another hundred years in the 1940s. It didn't even last five years. So people are not terribly good at the future, they project their own ambitions and hopes and aspirations of today onto the future. So let us imagine a more humane, more cooperative, more harmonious future for all our people and work towards it. And maybe if the, these people remain in power, which we are working to prevent, but if it does, maybe some of that change might still come from within. Maybe within themselves, they may realize that what they're doing is, is actually damaging the country, and there may be people within their establishment that will bring about change. They're already borrowing so many people into their ranks who did not grow up in their ecosystem, that there will be people who think like me who might be there to influence them. Let's hope so. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Shashi Tarur. Thank you, audience, for being such a wonderful one.